E podcast episode number two. Welcome to the Welcome to the A R E podcast. A R E podcast, where it's all about encouraging and inspiring you today, so you can fulfill your dream of becoming a licensed architect tomorrow. And now your host. He enjoys binge watching episodes of Breaking Bad. David Doucette. Hello, hello. Welcome back to our second episode of the ARE podcast. I'm joined today by our co-host, Eric Coryfried and Aubrey Baracchio. Welcome, guys. Great to be here. Good morning. <laughs> this is, our, uh, I think, our third take on trying to record this after some uh, Google Hangout difficulties yesterday. But alas, we've assembled this morning which uh, it's no small feat to get the three of us together anyway. So the fact that we did it twice in less than 24 hours is, is pretty good. <laughs> well, I don't know about you, but my social schedule is just packed. <laughs> so it's hard. It makes it harder. Yes, you're very in demand. Which actually, I didn't even mention, Eric, because you were so modest last week, that part of what you do, in, in addition to be a published author, is you go around the country and speak about green building and stuff. So we didn't even mention that. No, I was I was over I was over just so overwhelmed with the professionalism of this enterprise that I forgot to mention any of that. <laughs> so I speak at uh, I speak at about seventy events a year, which is more than one a week. Which is crazy. If you think about it, it's crazy. But as it's happening, I don't. But I love it because I meet um, I meet a lot of I meet a lot of architects and a lot, certain and a lot more candidates. And I get to hear all, all the things they don't like about NCARB and the ARE. And you, you get paid for the most part, too, which is kind of cool. Yeah, and they pay me, and they pay me. And they, then they usually take me to dinner and tell me how, uh, how charming I am. <laughs> and, then I, and then I come home and get yelled at by, by you two. So it's good. It's yeah, very good. It's exactly. Nice balance. All right. Well, uh, in today's episode, we are going to give an overview of the entire exam, the seven exams talk a little bit about NCARB, and then give our thoughts on uh, maybe the order you might want to consider uh, taking the exams. So the first thing we'll start off with is the, there are seven exams to the ARE or the, architecture or the Architect Registration Exam. It's administered by NCARB, which is the National Council of Architectural Registration Boards, and the tests are taking, taken at Prometric uh, testing centers. Uh, NCARB just launched uh, my exam portals on their website about a month ago, which allows candidates now to do all the scheduling and, and maintain their record all from their website. So you can find more information on that on ncarb.org. And, 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 uh, and you can now take the test overseas. And you can take the test overseas. That's right. Eric, you just wrote a post about that. Why don't you tell us about that? Well, if you if you uh, work in one of those uh, big offices that has uh, has other offices in London or Dubai or China, uh, soon you'll be able to take take your ARE exam in one of those places at a at a testing center there. So you won't have to you won't have to delay your your ambition of being an architect <laughs> simply because your office is forcing you to go over there. Well, and that's one of the things you wrote about, which I actually didn't even realize. London in Dubai is uh, available now, and I guess China is going to be following suit soon with Prometric testing centers. But uh, a lot of these bigger firms send, you know, young architects, you know, ah. young to be architects overseas to work for long periods of time. And when they're over there, the the five year rolling clock is ticking, so they have no way to, to or they haven't had any way to take the exams. And uh, <laughs> I just <laughs> and they have no way to take the exam, so now now they do. So it's pre it's it's a big deal, actually, right? I mean, there's a lot of firms. It affects a lot of people. Oh yeah, I've had a lot of friends that that, that have put their dreams on hold because an Abu Dhabi or, or Dubai or or um, or a London office opportunity came up, and that that just seemed like the bigger deal. So it. It um and now that problem's solved. So it's it's good news. It's good news for candidates. That's for sure. And well, it's about time they 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 kind of caught up to the twenty first century. We'll have to actually check in with your friends because you know we find excuses not to take the exam, for example, and that's a great excuse not to take. You know what? I can't take it because I'm working in London. So now they're going to have the opportunity. Let's see if they like 
if they take it or if they find another excuse. I'm sure that, well, excuses are common. And, and actually today I want to talk about um, fear because everybody, it seems everybody's got one, their, their one exam that they're terrified of. But that's not today's show topic. Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll see if we can work it in. You're so strict. <laughs> You're very hard to keep on point. Um, and I'm guilty of it too. All right, so we have the, the seven divisions, and uh, I'm going to run down them uh, quickly here, and then we'll talk about them. So the first division is schematic planning and design, which is SPD. I, site planning. Site planning and design. You know what? Thank you. There is a typo on our website. Whoever, you know, I got a contact who did our website. Um, that, was, that would be you. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. I just noticed that. By the way, you can see our overview. You can go to architectexamprep.com slash overview. That's architectexamprep.com slash overview and uh, see our, our graphics there. Uh, yes, yeah, so we have site planning and design, or SPD. Then we have programming, planning, and practice, or PPP. Then construction documents and services, or CDS. Building systems, or BD. Structural systems, SS. Building design and construction systems, BDC. And then finally, schematic design, or SD. So seven exams, they cover the, the breadth of what they think uh, we should be learning as architects and there's definitely um a couple of points i want to bring aubrey here in a second to talk about uh, there's a couple of these exams that have similar similarities that you might want to think about taking the exams uh back to back uh so aubrey why don't you uh tell us a, a couple of those exams that have i guess similar sort of content well, the two that come to mind initially are site planning design and programming planning and practice. Those two were actually originally in the old uh, testing series when there were nine exams. Those were part. Those were actually the same exam at one point. And CARB split them and made them two separate exams. So instead of splitting the material right down the middle and saying, okay, this this content goes to this one, this content goes to this exam, they actually did a lot of crossover. So unfortunately, when you're studying for one you may be missing some material if you're not also sort of covering some of the material for the other exam. And I experienced that firsthand. I took SPD first. Felt I did okay, but there were a few questions that kind of came out of left field. I had no idea what they were talking about. And when I opened the books to study for PPP, there was all the information that I was tested on an SPD, and I was completely caught off guard. So thankfully, I, it didn't derail me. I was able to still pass the exams. But had I known that ahead of time, I definitely would have gone over the material for both for each exam. Is is it too much to study for both simultaneously? How would you handle that? That's kind of a tricky question. I think it is. it would be a lot to study for both at the same time, especially PPP goes into, there, there are definitely some things in PPP that are not covered in SPD, specifically the practice side and contracts and all of that kind of stuff. So I think you kind of have to look and see, okay, maybe open up the table of contents, which which are covering the same topics, and just kind of give them a glance in the other exam that you're not currently studying for, just to see if there's any additional material that wasn't covered in the exam you are studying for. To me, that's just, it's cross-reference, and it's covering all your bases. And I should mention here, with schematic planning and design, or site planning and design, uh, that, well, actually, let me back up. Six of the seven divisions all have a multiple choice section and a graphic section. The exception is the schematic design, which is only a graphic section. So with site planning and design, there is a multiple choice section of 65 questions, and the graphic section is two graphic problems, a site grading, and a site design. With PPP, or programming planning and practice, 85 questions, multiple choice, and just one graphic problem, site zoning. So Aubrey, probably graphic-wise, PPP is probably easier, and SPD-wise, there's less multiple choice questions in the multiple choice section. That I, I The multiple choice side is definitely true. Uh, as far as the vignettes being easier or more difficult, I think that's sort of left up to perception. The, the two for site planning design 
are a little tricky. The site zone, or the I'm sorry, the site grading vignette does take a little bit to get the hang of, but once you understand how to man manipulate the contours, it's, it's fairly simple. The site plan, um, site design vignette is a little bit tricky, but the good thing about both of those vignettes is they're sort of open to artistic interpretation to a certain degree. You there's more than one correct answer. As long as you fulfill all the program requirements, your solution in theory will pass. However, the site zoning vignette, there's only one correct an answer. And if you get it wrong, it's wrong. So I think that makes that one a little bit trickier. I think, uh, I think our walkthroughs also kind of help you with that. Because with site grading specifically, once you kind of understand how to, draw the, how to draw the swales and kind of get that correct in your mind, I think you're better suited to to lay it out in, in you know any way that works. Well, with site zo with site zoning, it's it's. I thought it was fun, but it you know with site zoning, it's like this is it. If <laughs> if if you don't get every single requirement they have, you miss one little thing, you'll fail. It and I should mention that's a good point, Eric. That that these graphic, all these graphic uh, exams or these graphic portions, they're not necessarily testing our capabilities as an architect. At all, it's not stuff we really learned in, in school per se. All it's really testing is our ability to follow instructions, and that's really what we're trying to do: read the program, interpret the program, and and just do it based on that. We're not looking to you know to do necessarily beautiful designs or whatever it is. We're just trying to solve uh, the 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 program or the problem. I think that's where a lot of people get hung up on the vignettes is they. They're trying so hard to be an architect. They want to make a beautiful site plan. They want to grade a site perfectly and have it all, you know, even it level evenly from one end to the other. They want to make a site zoning that is this elegant, beautiful building shape and, and profile where that's not the intent. The intent is just follow the requirements and you pass. And it's it's pretty cut and dry. And it won't be it won't be beautiful either. I, I, oh, we, say, no. <laughs> we we actually tell you in the vignette in the vignette guide, you're not gonna win a Pritzker prize for whatever you come up with. It's not it's not gonna happen. So stop making it beautiful and focus on really just getting all of the criteria that they ask for. Yeah, it's really just just following the the instructions. So Aubrey, the, okay, so that's SPD and PPP. Let's bring in construction documents and services, or CDS, which uh, the three of them seem to, I feel like I want to group them together in terms of if I'm preparing for the exam. So how does CDS fit into this, Aubrey? Well, that was actually, CDS was actually the first exam that I took, and I did that on purpose because I wanted um, to start with an exam that seemed fairly focused, um, CDS basically goes over all of the AI contracts, the responsibilities of the architect, the owner, the contractor, all of the legal stuff involved in all of that. Um, there's only one vignette, which was very straightforward. It was a building section. Um, so that one, it basically f focuses on all of the contracts. So I can see how that exam and PPP would be good to have close to one another because you're going to be studying the same material in that sense. I, uh, I took CDS first and then followed it with site planning and design and PPP. I, if I had to do it again, I would probably keep the same order, but I would probably do a lot more crossover studying between the three exams just to make sure I had all my bases covered and really understood the material. And when I took the exam and when Eric took the exam back in um, the late 90s when it first transitioned to the computer, you know, the, the first one I took was programming. And as I said last podcast, I didn't study and I didn't pass, but I was sort of floored because, you know, I thought I knew programming. And what I realized afterwards is that programming, the programming at the time really en encompassed a lot of the other divisions and they had questions from the other divisions in there. So if you haven't studied the other divisions, you wouldn't really be familiar with that material. Uh is there a section that is like that now? It seems like SPD and PPP a, a little bit of crossover there, um, but it doesn't. It, is there one that encompasses uh, more content from the other sections? I would say if there's any that would be considered a, a cumulative exam, it would definitely be a BDCS. I right. saved that one second to last because I figured that after sort of reading the description of the exam and the content that it covered in the NCARB little study guides, I figured out very quickly that it was going to cover a little bit of a lot of areas. And originally, that was going to be the first exam I tackled. I thought, you know, go big or go home. And it's, it's about a week into studying it, I realized I'm in over my head. I need to take a step back and kind of 
reassess my approach. So I started much simpler and worked up to that one. And even when I took that exam, having all six of the priors in very recent history within the last few months, it was still, or I'm sorry, five of the priors because I still had one, one exam left, it was still a, a monster to tackle because there, there are some detailed questions in there you're not expecting and there's going to be those on every exam so you just have to do the best you can. If you don't know, try to make a good guess and just hope for the best in the end. So we have SPD, PPP, CDS are sort of, we could think of them as, as a, a little group and Aubrey, you're thinking CDS is kind of the most, I guess if we say straightforward, CDS would be the one the most straightforward because that's really focusing on uh, the contracts. Then we move into the building systems, the structural systems, and the building design and construction systems, or BDC. Uh, we could, I guess, start to think of uh, them as a group. And those, um, n none of those three are on the easier side. No, those are all the more difficult exams, and they're, they're, I mean, other than BDCS, which is the big one at the end, um, building systems and structural systems are kind of standalones in their own right. Building systems focuses on your plumbing and mechanical and electrical and doing a lighting layout diagram and all of that kind of stuff, um, and structural systems obviously focuses on structures and solving ridiculous equations that you're never probably going to use unless you decide to become a structural engineer. Um, so they are sort of stand standalones in that regard. However, I wouldn't, I, w I would definitely say for me personally, structures was more difficult. That was the exam that I lost sleep over. I did not want to take it when the results came in the mail. I didn't want to open them because I was terrified of the thought, oh my god, I have to take this again. <laughs> and it, it was the one exam that Three and a half hours of multiple choice questions is draining to anyone, and by the end, I I almost didn't care if I didn't pass because I was so exhausted and just mentally drained, and I just I wanted to get out of that test room. So I was very thankful that I passed and didn't have to do it again. But I've known people who have, and it's it it is a brutal mental. Uh, a day of mental abuse, basically, is a good way of putting it. it it's, it's like it's like that scene in V for Vendetta when they when they torture Natalie Portman. And then finally, finally at the end, she's like, whatever, I just see whatever you want me to see. I see, you know, it's kind of like that. <laughs> it's uh, structural systems was definitely my Achilles heel. And again, when Eric and I took it, there was nine exams and structures was actually split in two. It was um, uh, lateral structures, which was the easier one or long span structures. And then it was general structures, which was the really difficult one. And you guys knocked this thing out and. 16 and 18 weeks more power to you it took me i think all told maybe seven years um but the structural systems was my achilles heel because i i took the lateral and passed that one and then the general structures which is the one with the equations it took me two and a half years to take that exam and what i would do is i would study for four weeks or so i'd get ready to take it and then life would get in the way or work would get in the way and then i wouldn't take it and then a few months go by, and I'd forget everything, and then I'd have to study again. And life would get in the way, I'd have to reschedule. So I, I studied for four separate times by the time I actually took it. And then luckily when I took it, I did pass. But I was pretty prepared for it by the time I actually took it. But my only advice there is uh, don't, don't do what I did and you know stretch, stretch it out uh, over a couple of years. I will say, I will say for building systems... If, if in your IDP you've never really had an opportunity to work with a mechanical or electrical plan, uh, you're going to have a harder time studying for the test. I think unless it comes naturally to you, um, you, know, you know, one great thing is in your office is to, is to at least look at the mechanical and electrical sets that are coming into your drawings, maybe take some copies home <laughs> if you can, and, uh, and use them as a study guide because it'll, it'll help with... Um, with the study materials, uh, for structural systems, I that was the one I was most afraid of, because in my mind I thought, well, I, I didn't enjoy structures when I took it in school, <clears throat> and uh, I certainly um, certainly wasn't going to be able to memorize all those formulas. So I, I took a weird approach, and I'm not advocating this for anybody, but but my approach was, if I get all of the all the theory questions correct, and all the math questions wrong, I could still pass. 
And so on all of the math questions, anything that had a formula, I just used, um, I didn't do any math. I just kind of looked and said, well, that seems right. And I would answer that way. And I have no idea, you know, how many I got right or wrong, but I passed on the first try. Uh, uh, so that was, that was kind of, you know, refreshing to me. But it's, it's a brutal, it's a brutal exam. It's 125 questions over three and a half hours. And then at the end of that, then you have to do a vignette. So it's, it's five and a half hours total of testing and it's, it's it's a it's a rough day. You're not gonna you're not gonna go out that night. Let's put it that way. You're gonna go home and go to sleep. That's what's gonna happen. So we so the the moral here is we probably shouldn't pick structural systems as our first exam. No, I think if you do, you'll be so downtrodden that you might not, you might put off taking any of the others for a while. Well, structures structures I would put in. I I put it in in the middle with the idea that if I failed and I had to wait six months to take it again, uh, then. Then that way, at least by the time I'm done, the the, the others that I'd be ready to go. And and that's a, a good point too, because since you know I'm the one who took a while to pass these things, you know I'm the one who get to share these learning experiences because you guys just passed and you know move on. But I took the programming first, and when I didn't pass, it literally took the wind out of my sails, and I didn't take another one for two years. Um, so to your point, Eric, yeah, don't start off with something really hard. In fact, I think start off with the easier one. Uh, gain some confidence, you know, get into a flow, because uh, as you pass these things, you get more confident. Um, and then the last one here, schematic design or, or SD, that is, uh, that's a long time as well. Only a graphic, uh, graphic sections there, interior layout, one hour, and the building layout, four hour uh, testing time. I don't think it'll take most people four hours to do the entire building layout. I I think if you walk in, you know, using our guides especially, but if you walk in prepared, knowing what they're asking for, knowing what the requirements are, it won't take you the full six hour appointment time. The, the interior layout will. The interior layout, in fact, you might get pretty far along and discover that you missed one thing and then have to go back and redo it all again. But uh, um, uh, if you walk in prepared for building layout, you should, you should be able to do it in, in three hours. Not that it's a race, but still. But you're competitive. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm pretty competitive. <laughs> All right, uh, hold on one second. Yeah, I was, I was down to the wire. Oh, hold on, Aubrey. We got a, we got something coming in. Plan, practice, and pass with ArchitectExamPrep.com. <clears throat> All right, just had to throw that in. So. There is our overview of the, the seven exams. And Aubrey, now I want to talk about um, what you recommend as an order because there's different schools of thought where you start off with the harder ones first because if you don't pass them, you can study for the others while you're six months uh, before you can retake it again is kind of just ticking along. What's your take on that, Aubrey? I actually did have a very similar approach. I did um, structural systems basically third to last, I believe. And the reason I did that was I figured, okay, well, I have two more exams. If I fail structures, I'll be able to take two additional exams during the six-month waiting period as well as begin studying for structures again. So I, I purposely kind of started with a, I wouldn't say simpler, but more focused exam, and then I ended with SD, which I found to be the most straightforward since there were no multiple choice and I, I was the most confident that that would be the one that I wouldn't fail and then end up waiting around for six months not being able to do anything in order to retake it. So that was my approach was to sort of group the three hardest ones right in the middle so that if I happen to fail one of them I'd have something else to do while I'm you know kind of biding my time waiting six months to retake them. And the the order that we're showing on our website, again, architectexamprep.com slash overview, it's the order that we're actually creating the material. Um, and it is, you know, it's a pretty good order. Um, if somebody is considering looking at an order, we have a, a pretty decent order there. We end with schematic design. We have structural systems in fifth place there. Eric, what's your take on, uh, on taking easier ones first or harder ones first? What do you say for I last? I think, you know, I, I think in, in many ways the, the exams are a marathon, and I think it's as important that you study as your mental, your mental state at the time. Uh, I, I think if you go in saying, I'm going to take all seven of these exams, it's, it's inevitable, it's going to happen, and I know that I have to do that, that 
and and go in this thing, I'm going to probably fail a couple on the way, and that's okay. I think if it, it's you know, I, I think that's a normal part of the process. But I think if you go in there knowing, okay, there's seven exams, I'm going to study for each each one, one at a time, and, and do it. I, I love the idea of taking one that you feel most confident with and getting it. And the beauty of it is, if you time it right, you know, I I gotten into a cycle that of taking the exams every two weeks that I would receive the letter right with you know telling me that I passed usually the, a day before I was about to take the next one and that really added wind to my sales it really kind of got me going and but you know that that's if you're on this accelerated path to get through it um, I, I don't want to necessarily advocate that either but I, I think I think pick you know pick one or two that you feel most confident with do those first pass those get them out of the way and um, and then some of the more intimidating ones which for me was structures, but for you might be something else. Then take that, so that way, if you do if you do fail that one, that you've got six months while you can take the other ones before you can take structures again. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think take the take the easier ones first, uh, build up some confidence. And I did save, uh, I believe it was building design and construction systems last. And uh, and you know, I I figured oh, I know that I'm going to pass that, and and I took it. And then being in California, um, although all my paperwork was with New York, so as soon as I passed it, I would get my license in New York, but I was in California. So I already started studying for the California supplemental exam, waiting for my results for the building design and construction systems. And then I got my letter that I didn't pass. And, I, you know, again, I was floored. Those are the two I didn't pass, the programming the first time and, and the building design and construction the, the last time. So uh, I had to wait another six months. So it killed my plans of studying for the the California supplemental exam, or I shouldn't say killed. I just delayed it six months. Um, so yeah, I like that idea. Um, you know, maybe schematic design last, as Aubrey did. Uh, then it just you know gives you a little time for that uh, that six months if if and when it comes up. But I think to Eric's point is uh, the main thing is to just take these exams. I see it with the California Supplemental Exam candidates who are taking it and just keep putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. The main thing is just take it. Get in the groove and and expect you, you'll you probably fail a couple, and, and that's fine. It's just part of the process. And I think once you get through it and once you get licensed, nobody's going to ask you how many times, you know, it took you to get through it or how many times did you have to take the, you know, these divisions unless you're doing a podcast about it and then you have yeah, to you, fess up. You ask, you ask me that all the time. <laughs> I, I will I will also say one one interesting thing that happens is after you take them, uh, by the time you get to the sixth, seventh, you're so comfortable with their crappy NCARB software that it makes it a little easier. You're kind of used to, you know, how the software works because because you've been through it and you're also used to the testing environment you've probably gone to the same testing location now for all of them so so the the more tests you take uh, uh, I, I would say a lot of that a lot of that unknown stress you know the, un, the of the unfamiliar dissipates quite a bit and why don't we actually you were bringing up fa- fear earlier since um, uh, actually before we we go to to fear like what you hear like what you Show the love by giving us a review on iTunes. All right, since we're shifting gears a, a little bit, uh, <laughs> so what were you saying earlier? You wanted to say about fear, Eric. Everybody, I'm every you know all my, all my friends that have taken the test. It seems that everybody's got one, at least one exam that was their biggest worry, and uh, and it might not necessarily even be the one that they failed. Like you were worried about structures, and you passed that on the first try. And the one that you thought you had in the bag, you know, BDC, that's the one you you uh, exactly you barfed on. So, um, I, I everybody's got that one fear. I the idea of taking it third in, I wouldn't take it. Definitely not take it first. But by taking it third in, you're used to the testing center. You know where to park. You know where to go. You know you know what com- clothes are comfortable. You know to pee ahead of time. You know not to bring anything into the room with you. You know you're 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 kind of used to it at that point. So to, I would say take your take the one that you're most scared of, you know, a second if not third, and then and um, and of course study for it. You nobody will pass any of these without studying. That's just this that's just this the truth of it. Aubrey, do you wanna I, I, go ahead? I actually uh, I agree a lot with what Eric was saying. I found myself I got into a routine where I found 
I was actually more comfortable um, taking the early morning exams as opposed to the later afternoon ones because I one I just wanted to kind of get it all over with and not have it take up the majority of my day and spend the entire morning worrying and you know second guessing myself and all of that kind of stuff but I also I got into a routine and I got very disciplined about okay this is it's almost like kind of like one of those things I guess athletes sometimes do before a game where they have this ritual that they follow and it's it's almost like superstitious so I, I had something somewhat similar to that. Um, my biggest rule, though, because I I find myself having to use the restroom on a regular basis just anyways, but also when I get nervous, it makes it even worse. I would purposely, and I don't advocate this to anyone because it, it gives you a headache at the end of the day, I would purposely dehydrate myself. I wouldn't drink anything that morning <laughs> because I did I didn't want to have to get up and run out of the testing room to use the bathroom and my clock is still ticking. I wanted to wait until that break. So, you know, I was on a strict no coffee, no water. No, I would eat breakfast, but it would be, you know, a piece of toast or something, something that wouldn't um, hydrate me too much. So that was that was sort of my ritual that I took into it. And it, it helped because I could focus on the material because I wasn't worrying about having to go to the bathroom or being distracted by something else. So I think establishing some sort of a, of, a, of a routine before you go into these things helps with your confidence level and it helps calm your nerves as well. It's also uh, it's also good to to just remember it's it's a it's a bit of a physical endurance as, as well this test. So don't be shy about stretching, about shifting in your seat, about making sure that you're comfortable, you know, getting things going. Sometimes if I felt I was getting drowsy through the multiple choice, I would I would dance bounce my legs quickly, uh, you know, to kind of get the blood flowing again. I think uh, they kick you out of the testing center now if you do that. <laughs> no, they don't. But, it, it do, you know, do what you need to do to, 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 to stay alert. Uh, it, it really it really makes a difference. Uh, and then, I, you know, the, I, I, I've met a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people that told me that they would work in the morning and then they would go take their exam, you know, at 2 in the afternoon or something. And that's just crazy because you're bringing with you all the stress of that day. If you can, if you can take the day off, great. If not, maybe do the exam first thing, and then then you can go back to work and you can kind of celebrate with uh, you know celebrate with your coworkers, you know, hey, another one down, and then you know and then get drunk that night or whatever you need to do. But uh, uh, but but you, you know you want to go you want to go in there mentally prepared for it. Uh, and um, and it, it's tough enough. Don't make it harder on yourself by working a half day beforehand if, if you don't have to. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that as well. I've known people who have also taken that same approach. And I think what makes it difficult is if you if you go to work before you're going into this big exam, you're really not you're really not doing uh, well at either. You're going to be completely distracted while you're at work because you're stressed about the exam and nervous about it so you're not going to be very productive and then by the time you get to the exam you maybe you're stressing about something at work you got a new deadline or you know some new project came up that now you have to focus all of your time on there's there's going to be some sort of distraction so I 100 percent agree just take the day off or take the morning off whatever you have to do to just focus on one thing at a time one of the uh, one of the big fears <clears throat> that I ha had or concerns going in was um, I didn't know if I had studied the right things you know the study guides I was using. I don't want to name who they were by, but but they 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 weren't they weren't very focused, and so there was a lot of things in there that I thought, well, this can't surely this can't be on the test, and um, and it, and it wasn't, and so I ended up studying a lot of things that were the wrong things. And one of the things that I like, I mean, not to pl plug our guides, but one of the things I like about what we've done with our study guides is that um, all of the sections are basically they match you know, one-to-one -to, -one to, to what NCARB sections are telling you what's on the exam. So we've essentially given you a, a roadmap of what to study, how to study it, and then walk in there prepared. But the disclaimer to that is, uh, you're right, and that was that was by design. We wanted to follow NCARB's uh, layout. Um, but with that said, I'm sure there's going to be sort of those, you know, WTF questions that are on any exam. They're on the California Supplemental Exam. They're on any, any ex professional exam we take that nobody could have prepared for it's not covered in the study material so do i just want a, a little disclaimer there eric that we well there's also there's also those questions that you know that ncarbs put in to te that you know they tell you that they're 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 experimenting with right you're their big you're you're their big lab rat so 
<laughs> and cab does so, that too and you don't know which ones are the experimental questions or not but you know it's uh, yeah you're you're you know you're you'll be in building design and construction and suddenly you you'll get a question of uh, hey what's the atomic weight of barium and you're like why why is that in here that shouldn't be in here <laughs> and just throws you a curveball don't let it phase you i you know they're they're um remember you know they're they're trying to see what questions work and don't work and and uh um know that going in all right. I, I treated every multiple choice question as if it was graded 100%. I didn't try to guess which ones in CARB was grading and which ones they weren't. And the other helpful thing is that you can mark questions and come back to them to review when you're finished. So I would go through and <clears throat> the questions that I knew right off the bat, oh, I know the answer to that. I feel confident. I would, I would answer it and I'd move on. Any ones that I wasn't sure, I would guess and then I'd mark it. That way, at least the question was answered. Heaven forbid the time ran out and I wasn't go able to go back and review all the marked questions. But if I did have time, I could go back and review them. Maybe there was a question later in the exam that provided more information for the one I was questioning, and now I feel more confident on it. But that was just my approach. Is I, I didn't try to second guess what NCARB was, including for real and what they were just kind of playing with. Well, remember, you know, with each, with each test going in, you know how many questions they're going to ask, and you know how much time you have. So... For instance, with structures, I knew that I had I had uh, 210 minutes of testing, three and three and a half hours. I knew that there were 125 questions, so I knew I had a, probably a minute and a half or so on each question. And so, I, if there was a question that I was spending more than that amount of time on, I'd mark it and go back. You know, uh, and if I and if and the ones that I knew right away, just like Aubrey said, I would I answer those and not mark them and never look at them again. Right. And, um, and and it really helped. You really have to manage your time. The test is about really following directions, and part of those directions is managing your time, you know, doing, do, you know, answering everything in the time that you're allotted. And speaking of following directions, uh, I will say th today's episode is about uh, the overview of the exam, but Aubrey and Eric have also added uh, exam-taking <laughs> tips and techniques into the uh, conversation, um, which... Of course, we're very thankful for, and and that's what's fun about this podcast. We can share this stuff, and in you listening to the podcast, this is the place that you can come back to and hopefully get some inspiration, and encouragement, and entertainment. And maybe you take a test that didn't go so well. Well, you can you know listen to us, and hopefully, uh, we'll uh, you can commiserate with us. Let's put it that way. <laughs> All right, Eric. Any uh, I'm in dangerous ground throwing it back to you as I'm trying to wrap up. But is there anything else you want to add in closing? Not not well, starting a, to, a new topic. <laughs> oh, okay, I have a lot that I'd like to complain about. But uh, um, in closing, uh, you know, I uh, I think uh, I think lay lay out for yourself a, a plan of which tests you want to take in what order, and know that and know that ahead of time. Um, and and you could tie that into a study schedule. You can tie it to a calendar and start to see other things going on in your life. You know, if you um, the beauty of laying it on a calendar is you can see if there's other big deadlines maybe in your office that you need to worry about or if there's other holidays or if you've got a wedding that you need to go to and you know you're not going to study that weekend. Include that in include that in your plan. Uh, you know, really lay it out. Lay it out like a big project, knowing that you're going to take all seven of these. It's inevitable. Don't be scared and just do it. All right, and Aubrey, I'm going to throw it to you, actually, and I'm going to throw it to you in the – I'm going to put you on the spot here. For us to give you to get for you to give us your preferred exam taking order of the seven divisions, starting with number one. Well, for me personally, and I do, I one hundred percent agree with what Eric just said. Kind of laying it all out in the calendar. I actually, um, when I decided the order I wanted to take them in, I actually uh, took some. Um, I believe it was cardstock paper, and I, I drew up a schedule for myself. Okay, this one is first, then this one, then this one. And I would write in the date the exam was taken, and I'd leave that blank because I didn't know yet, and then I would write in date passed. And on the side of that, I kept track. Every time I, I passed an exam, I drew like one of those little thermometers when you know charities are trying to fundraise and get to their goal. I would color in each part of my progress as it went, and I knew okay, this exam is, you know, I'm 15% closer to becoming an architect or whatever, and I would keep track of that, and that was inspiring to me. I would post it on the wall and look at it every time I was studying, like, wow, I'm halfway done, or I'm three-quarters of the way done. So as far as exam order, um, me personally, I took um, CDS first, 
I wanted to be somewhat focused. Then I did SPD and PPP, realizing they covered a lot of the same topic material. Then I went into um, uh, building systems. I figured, OK, I'm going to get into the hard ones, and I wanted to start with one that I wasn't as terrified of. After that, I did structures, and then uh, BDCS, and then I took uh, site uh, schematic design as the very last one, purposely saving it because I was mentally drained as far as multiple choice, and I just wanted to focus on uh, the vignettes at that point. So after that, then I was freed up to study for the CSE since I'm in California as well. But if I were to do it again, I would probably do the same order. I may study for them a little bit differently, um, especially SPD and PPP. I would definitely lump those two together. Those, those were the ones that I felt were the closest related of all of the exams. All righty, cool. Well, thank you, guys. I think that is going to wrap up our uh, episode today at 40 minutes. It's, it's amazing how quickly um, this goes by, but all three of us uh, – have the gift of gab. Uh, I will admit it. I don't know if you guys will admit it, but uh, I, I'll admit I'll, it. I'll admit it. You you have the gift of gab. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> hey, I got I got every one of my report cards in grade school said Aubrey's a very intelligent student, but she talks too much in class. <laughs> well, see, I think intelligent people talk a lot, right? It makes sense. You got a lot yeah. to say. Dumb people, dumb people talk a lot too. Don't. <laughs> <dumb people. laughs> All right, guys, we will, uh, we're going to wrap this up, and uh, here we go. Thanks for listening to the ARE Podcast. Be sure to visit architectexamprep.com and check out our other podcast episodes, video tips, and the ARE blog. Remember to plan, practice, and pass.